So I'm Gwen Ann Harrison Jones and I'm the head teacher at Candice Hill the Secondary School in Fairham and I'll give you a bit more context about the school in a second. One of my colleagues is here today, so hello Kelly, wherever you are. Hi. Um, it's my seventh year as head teacher at Candice Hill. I was seven years as a deputy at Warblington School in Haven, so Candice Hill is in Fairham. Um, I taught in Haven before and prior to that I was head of PE at large secondary school Wilden in Southampton, Hedgeend. I live in Portsmouth, I'm a military wife, husband's an officer of the Royal Navy, off and away. I'm mother to two children who are now seven and eight. They were one and two when I took up post. Um, life is fairly extreme, often spent outside, side of a skate park, rugby pitch, hockey pitch, you name it. Um, and being a head teacher is my absolute dream job. Um, I get up every day with a smile on my face and it fills me with an incredible joy to do the job that I have the honour of doing. And it's a privilege to be invited here today to talk about our experiences. So Camps Hill, we're a standalone academy, which means we're a single school of one. You can be a multi-academy trust, you can be a local authority school, and there are some schools, a minority, that are just standalone, and that's us. We've got about 1,270 pupils, 11 to 16, 240 to 270 now in each year group. 60% of each cohort is high ability on entry, lower than average national free school meals, SEA and pupil premium. I think that's important and I'll explain that in a second. We are fully staffed with specialist teachers and we've got a relatively low staff turnover in the last three to four years. Relationships are strong, horizontal year groups with really, really positive pastoral care and a real emphasis across the whole school on that care guidance and support. We've got vertical houses named after Royal Navy ships, nothing to do with me, um, but that gives us a little bit more sense of um, aspirational family, if you like, and some schools have moved more towards a house system. We've got an average class size of 24, which again shows you that emphasis that we place on care, guidance and support. I think the reason for some of the context is partly around the stigma that is attached to perhaps death by suicide and linked to areas of deprivation, and actually, what we do as a school is talk about that anyone, anytime, anywhere, and how we can be as prepared as we can be, because we have no major deprivation, but then mental health isn't linked to the ADAPT index, and we should be ready and prepared as we can be. We've got to talk about it, and we are so much better at Camps Hill now than we were about talking about these kinds of sensitive issues. So I want to talk to you about what happened with us, what we did and why we did it, and I want to talk to you about what we are doing now and also what we want to do, because we're on a journey. Um, and some might see it that this journey happened in a very sort of sad way to start with. But I'm ever the optimist and I'm always about finding positives from every single situation that we encounter and learning from it as well and being better as a result. I think it's also important to say that this is 20 minutes in a really brief summary and we're not the experts. Sadly, we had to experience these two incidents, but far from the experts are we. But what we are, I think, quite a few of us at the school who went through this together, is compelled to share our experience on the hope that it might change one person's perspective of dealing with a similar sort of incident or give them confidence or somebody to talk to. We've changed significantly as a school as a result, particularly of the first incident of sudden child death, and it's changed me as a person, professionally and personally, which I think is really important. I've talked about being ever optimistic, and I think it's always important to find those positives out of every situation, regardless of how challenging they may be. So in February half term 2019, I was stood with my husband in the kitchen. It was what we call the witching hour in our house, um, which is that hour just before bedtime, when I've got two children 13 months apart, and things can get a bit hairy. And my phone went and I received two emails in quick succession from the local authority. We're not a local authority school, so I get very little from them, and it was half term. And my husband said to me, what are you doing? You're working, it's half term. I'm fairly work obsessed, so it's not uncommon. But I read the emails and they asked me to make a call to the local authority. And when I made that call, I received the information that one of our young people in year 11 had died very suddenly, very unexpectedly. I walked back into the kitchen and I said to my husband, one of my children at school has died. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, and I remember vividly, I have absolutely no idea, but we're going to put the children to bed, I'm going to think about it, and then I'm going to make a plan. And that's exactly what I did, is I made that plan. 
This particular boy, if you work in school, you'll know him or similar boys to him. He's one of the black coat crew, you know, the North Face puffer jacket boys. Um, they're there at lunchtime everywhere you don't want them to be. You move them on, they end up at the next place you don't want them to be. Large friends, very confident, very sociable young people. The family were known very well to us, three boys, one of which had gone through the school, the other of which was already in the school as well, lower down. <coughs> The death was described as unexplained eventually, but initially um, there had been a party the night before, there had been drugs and alcohol at that party, um, and therefore there was a fair amount of media interest. Um, James had climbed up to the top of the car park roof in the middle of Ferrantown Centre, and he slipped, tripped, jumped or fell from that roof and was found by a cleaner at quarter to six the next morning. Nobody will ever really know what happened, but what there became was a police investigation and we were part as a school to the rapid response meeting, which I didn't even know existed before this point, which talked about interrogating CCTV, mobile phone records, interviewing passers-by. The media interest was really high, something that I think I was quite naive about at that stage as a professional leading a response from the school point of view. I remember having a particularly tricky conversation with the editor of the Portsmouth News who wanted to print a news story with his name and the family had given explicit instruction that his name was not to be released but because it had been released on social media, the editor told me he therefore had jurisdiction to go ahead and print it. And I had to be really firm from the car park at Port Solent on the way back from Snow and Rock. And I again remember the conversation saying, you're going to do this and go against the wishes of the family. And eventually they didn't. But I questioned why that had suddenly become my role in this whole experience. But you learn from it very, very quickly. Our second young person was again year 11 and again male. And in January 2020, on a Tuesday evening, we received information that he'd been taken to hospital following an attempt to die by suicide, and he spent a week in hospital on life support. What we found out after from one of the intensive care consultants was the statistics for recovery from an attempted death by hanging are very, very low. And again, I didn't know that, and I didn't want to ask. So what we prepared for as a school in that week was a possible life continuing rather than a probable life ending. And that sounds really harsh, but had I known that, my preparation may have been slightly different because there are things within a large school community that you can do to begin to prepare for the news that is going to be particularly, well, as bad as it can be. This boy was very, very different, very introverted, um, extremely bright, a very, very able group of fairly introverted friends as well. Family not known to us at all, a younger sibling due to come to our school the following year who is now with us. What we also found out following his death was that he'd had some prior CAMS intervention. The CAMS, CAMS thing is quite interesting by the way. Um, obviously CAMS here and, and CAMS, but he had had some prior CAMS intervention and we learned a lot more about what that was. But his family were very private, whereas the first young person family talked openly to us, we knew very little about um, the intervention that this young person had had. I guess when it comes down to what we did and why, Um, I just want to talk you very, very briefly through, in the hope that you may pick up one or two things that if this ever happened in your setting may be useful. I talked and I called this solidarity, sensitivity and support because it's about working together. So when I got that phone call about James in half term, I decided fairly quickly that I needed to do this with one other key person in school. And I chose his head of year, and actually, ironically, she was the same head of year for the second boy as well. I didn't choose one of my deathly head teachers because what I became very aware of is that school needed to function as normal while we were responding, if you like, to this disaster. So there was a sense of dis uh, disaster kind of response whilst also maintaining business as normal. And again, I don't wish to sound harsh by that, but this was one pupil out of a community of 1,270. And for a lot of our young people, they needed school to continue in the same way for their sense of normality, as did our families. So I chose that person to work with really closely to enable that school, our school business to continue to function, but also to make sure that there was sensitive link with the family as well. We script a lot at Camps Hill. We did a bit of work with Paul Dix using a book called When the Adults Change, all about adult behaviours, therefore influencing children's behaviours, and it was pivotal to a huge change for us. That element of scripting, for example, to take the worry away from staff, what do I say? 
How do I say it? So we wrote paragraphs, we did videos, we did assemblies, we recorded messages. That's me and the other person leading. So the staff didn't have to worry about that. We took the hard hit for our colleagues, um, which was exhausting, but that element of self-care between us, we grew very close over the, the Bears incident in particular. Um, we worked very carefully with parents, parents of both pupils, and they were very, very different. The first people we ran most things that we did past the parents in order to receive their blessing, if you like. Sadly, we were slightly more confident the second time around, and the family didn't want to engage with us in the same way. They dealt with their own grief in a very different way to the first family. The first family used the school, and because I think the younger siblings at school, they wanted to maintain a very, very high level of engagement with us. And the second family was completely the opposite. No two situations are ever the same. We were um, very available to our community, which was exhausting but vital. So many parents and staff had my work mobile number from back then and still have it now. And I'm still in communication with some of those, the, the best friends of James from when they left um, their parents two, three years ago now, still occasionally will tell me about 18th birthdays or milestones or college, which I really enjoy. We thought carefully, but almost by accident, about where we had opportunities for moments to pause for thought. So we had a bench at the front of school that we um, put flowers on. So the day after James's death, we took a bunch of flowers to his family, and then we put a bunch of flowers on the bench outside school. But I wish someone had told me how important that particular area was. Accessible to pupils and staff, so they could pause for thought, but not accessible to the general public. We also had CCTV fairly deliberately on that area, not for the sake of this event, but it meant we could monitor who was visiting, who needed time, who perhaps needed some support that wasn't seeking it elsewhere. The other thing we did was we identified an area for which our pupils could access that was monitored and supported by professionals. So we used the library, and in the library our year 11 pupils, particularly with James, they taught each other to play chess, they made tea and coffee, we always had a member of staff on hand, and we gently weaned them off their high level need for grief and support, back to business and normal as we saw fit for each individual. And that was really hard, and we got to know families very, very well, so there wasn't a one size fits all. I urge Corson to colleagues that I've worked with, and there have been five other colleagues since um, 2020 that I have supported head teacher wise with sudden child deaths at their school. And I've always urged caution on getting too involved with some of the celebration of life activities. So we worked with a Methodist minister who was the parent of one of our year 11s, and it would have never crossed my mind to sort of access her for support. We're not a faith denomination school, um, but she provided common sense spiritual support, which was really, really useful. And one of the best things she said to me was, try to make sure your celebration of life at school is as close to the funeral as possible just after it, so that you then get a sense of closure. Our involvement with the funeral for both boys was different. The first pupil, because he lived opposite school, the funeral cottage came through the school and a number of hundreds of people stood out to pay their respects. Two of us were at the crematorium in Porchester and 17 pupils attended that funeral. What I wish somebody had told me was to make sure that their parents also attend. 14 of them had no parents there. Their parents dropped them off. So what I found I became was the pseudo-parent for those 15, 6-year-olds whose funeral of a friend they were attending, some of them the first funeral ever, and I was quite traumatised by that with my colleague because I hadn't anticipated that. And again, that's something I've shared widely with colleagues since. The second funeral was at the South Downs Natural Burial Site, so it's a Petersburg Proxford way, I think, so it involves a drive. So naturally, parents were there and they'd organise lifts. Had it been at Porchester, we would have said that parents need to be there to provide that emotional support. Um, the celebration of life, the wake, sorry, go back to the funeral for a second. So we were uncomfortable in the first instance attending the wake, and we tried to remove ourselves from the funeral service. But what we didn't realise is that the parents wanted us there, because school is such a major part of our young people's lives that having that sort of ratification linked with the school, ability for us to tell stories. So we went to the wake, and the second wake we went to, we felt a lot more comfortable and confident to be able to talk about stories with the young person that we'd experienced with them at school, and we knew both of them well, although the second much quieter than the first. 
In the um, immediate aftermath following both of the sudden deaths, we used the school nursing service, the ed psych team, we appointed a counsellor, and we used assistant heads of year who were non teacher members of staff at school. At this point, we only have three of those working across two year groups. We now have five, of which my colleague here today is newly appointed one, to increase that capacity. Because what we saw develop during that support time was the irreplaceable relationships between those members of staff and young people in seeking informal support. The open conversations about mental health and well-being, about self-care, about removing the stigma, it won't happen here, you know, why would it happen to us? It has happened, so how are we therefore dealing with it as positively as we can? We did a memory book, we had a tree of life. What we weren't prepared for was more random pupils to come out of the woodwork who had known the young, <coughs> young person that had passed away. Um, so, for example, um, an Xbox friend um, that they, they'd interacted with online, um, somebody from Scouts or Sea Cadets. So it's those sorts of interactions that we weren't expecting and therefore having a response to be prepared for that as well. Um, one thing that we learned a lot from was staff and their own physical responses to the sudden child deaths. So they wanted to interrogate their last encounters. Why did I say what I did? Why didn't I? What if I had? And also the personal experiences staff that came to the forefront. We had one member of staff whose brother attempted to die by suicide when they were very young, and that brought up a lot of things for him. We did various other, um, the separation of life were particularly special and they were very, very specific to each individual. We planned that with their friends and they scripted it, they chose the music and we told stories. And we were able to laugh without guilt and at both of those celebrations of life, the parents talked to the young people about their future. And that was one of the singularly most powerful moments at the first celebration of life was when James's mum stood up and she hadn't been able to um, tell me whether she could go through with it or not until the morning and she, she looked at me and I got to know her very well and I still do now and she looked at me and she said I'm going to do it and I just mouthed thank you um, and she got up and she stood and she talked to them about their exams and she talked to them about how they had to continue working as hard as they could because her son couldn't so she, they had to do it for her and her son and it was incredibly moving. In the second service that we did with Joe, his dad stood up and spoke, very different, but equally as powerful in the message to his friends, thanking them for their support and helping to reduce their guilt that they then felt of not knowing why he did what he did. We have ribbons, so I still wear today a blue ribbon for Joe and a red ribbon for James, and staff all have those ribbons on their lanyards, and it's just a daily reminder to us of what we went through and why we're stronger as a result. Those open conversations are really important, and that shift in culture um, is almost immeasurable. So it's all aspects of mental health for us, but it's not about us becoming experts. We are education, there is health, social care, policing that we can refer to, but opening up those conversations gave us the opportunity to signpost and remove that stigma. And also having the confidence to say, I don't know, but I'll find out. Because sometimes our young people, don't they, the trusted adults in their world, they think we're the oracle. But actually, for them to hear from you that you don't know, uh, but you'll seek advice from a professional that might know, and again, not trying to solve all of their problems in one solution go, I guess. I've talked a little bit about increased pastoral support, those assistant heads of year, crucial non-teaching members of staff available to our young people. And then we looked at support and coaching and training for our tutors, so teachers who are a tutor at the morning, the afternoon, or the start and the end of the day, and we reviewed our curriculum as far as what we talk about with regards to positive mental health, well-being, suicide. We've engaged with camps a lot more than we ever did before um, because what we tried to do was dig around and find out what was out there for us. Um, it's a bit of a frustration of mine at the moment, and Helen knows this, that resources are going into schools but they're going into schools in areas of deprivation. You know, mental health isn't linked to that and many of our young people through the pandemic were unaware the full extent of some of the um, negativity that they've experienced. And I would argue that in my school, the majority of my families work, and therefore the experience that my young people have had at home during home learning and periods of lockdown is two parents trying to be online working, and therefore saying to their young person, get back to your bedroom, you need to get online, I'm in a meeting. 
They haven't been furloughed, they haven't been out of work, very fortunately, but the challenges are very different. And I think as a school leader, acknowledging the challenges of your own community and how they different they are school to school is really, really important. But it does frustrate me that there isn't a resource going into white British middle class schools where there are very different challenges. And that's not to detract from the challenges that are happening in schools where there are areas of deprivation. I get that completely and my colleague heads I speak to regularly. There are just different challenges. And it's acknowledging that for me that's really important. So we sadly had double the learning, but I see that as a positive because we were able to um, look at a response with James and then tweak that in a different way when we had to respond to Joe's sudden death as well. Relationships are key, our open culture is key. Those two incidents in close succession meant that we learned so much very, very quickly. We became as a school a lot closer to our families, a lot closer to our wider community. We have a pack dog, which is singularly one of the biggest most brilliant things we've ever accidentally done. So we have a parent of four boys at school who's crisis counsellor trained. Um, two of the boys have gone through the school already. One now works at the school, the other is going through the school. All four are autistic and she has, uh, she doesn't work and she has very many skills. And one of the things she does is she brings Barney into school. And when, when Jo sadly passed away, what she did was she bought a, um, one of those thrower things and a tennis ball and she took some of these six foot two um, year 11 boys who wouldn't talk to anyone onto the field to throw a ball for Barney. And after 20 minutes of conversation with her, she'd say to them, have you, have you thought about you know, talking to anybody about how you're feeling? No way I'd do that. And she'd say, you know, well, you've just done that with me for 20 minutes and hopefully you'll find that useful and you'll come and do it again. And she did. Um, and that element of more informal, non-teacher dialogue has opened up that sense of openness and positive conversation as well. It is important that you get the right person for that and we've, we've really hit gold with her um, because of her crisis counselor training as well and the impact that she can have. But it is about always listening and always learning and always prepared to have that conversation and a positive approach culture. The resource pack that I talk about, there's a lot out there I know to support child bereavement, um, which is which science says, but what I didn't find as a head teacher was tips and tricks, those real logistical things. I wish somebody had told me that. And I wrote an article for the TS after James died with the blessing of his family called exactly that. Because had somebody just said these things to me, I could have gone, oh yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but here we go. And that's what I've done in producing these resources that I informally share with colleague head teachers. And it's a little bit about myth busting as well and removing the stigma. As I say, what we'd like to do then, um, so we'd like to work even more closely with CAMS to develop even more support for young people. There is a hidden epidemic, I believe, post pandemic, although I believe we still do, if you look at schools and numbers in schools at the moment. Um, I've got two year 11 pupils in tier four beds currently. I didn't know what a tier four bed was until September, and some of you in here may still not know, but I learned a lot very quickly. Are they both as a direct result of the pandemic? Possibly not, but I do know it's contributed because of the amount of time that our young people have spent online. We've seen an exponential increase, particularly in girls with instances of self-harm. Um, people have had, young and young people have had very different experiences of lockdown. There is a lack of social confidence, a lack of social resilience. There is a curiosity with lots of time spent online researching gender identity, sexuality, all of those things that now complicate what is already a challenging society in which our young people are growing up. And I think the more we can do in education to signpost towards professional support, but also to provide that informal support is crucial. <coughs> And we need to develop a mental health culture in school, and that's self-care for professionals, and that's openly talking about staff well-being as well. It's not the bottom of the list, and it's not just cakes on a Friday, but it does frustrate me when people don't recognise that cakes on a Friday is as important as other things as well, because they all contribute to the overriding culture where you know that staff well-being, pupil well-being is top of your list. Through that, throughout the pandemic, as a school leader, I used to talk about staff, pupils, families being just two things, safe and happy. And I think if you hold on to those two things, you strip back all the white noise that's going on and you realise what's really, really important. Mid-pandemic, we've got a part-time maths teacher who's also an artist. Um, it's quite an unusual combination, but he drew me three Bs because we talked about be patient, be thoughtful, be kind at Camps Hill, and we've adopted these as a really simple mantra <coughs> towards how we approach supporting young people and each other. Um, they grew by osmosis. 
but they mean a lot to us and they're very, very simple. We've got to hold on to the positives from our learning in such deep, dark, sad times. We've got to find out what it is that's made us better and how we can continue to improve. Fundamentally, it's all about the people. And you can talk about strategy and you can talk about plans, but actually you've got to look out for and after all of your people. And that for me as a school leader through these two times of crisis was the most important thing for me to do. Acknowledging that we talk, we listen, we learn, we share, we reflect, we respect, we change, we think, we question, and we really, really show that we care.